Okay, let's expand on this idea of reference frames and relativity. So, reference frames. A frame of reference is a set of coordinates that can be used to describe the position of an observer. Okay? Now, the observer considers their reference frame to be at rest and everything else around them to be moving. And this is this idea of relativity. So, any other motion is uh, measured by them as being relative to them, to their frame. Okay? So, you can measure quantities such as length, time, velocity, mass, and so on. So the important thing to realise is this idea of relativity has been around for a while and we've been fairly familiar with it before. It's the idea that all motion is relative to the reference frame that the observer is in. Okay? So, some new ideas here though is to distinguish between an inertial reference frame and a non-inertial reference frame. So, in an inertial reference frame, a velocity is constant and that includes being at rest. Okay? In a non-inertial frame, we're actually call, talking about a situation where the frame is accelerating. So we're going to be mostly dealing with this stuff, or this is the only thing we're going to deal with at high school. General relativity, which is done at unis and stuff, is actually where you've got a non-inertial reference frame. So let's consider these two situations here. This is very similar to the light bulb one that I showed you. If you've got a, a train at rest and there's a girl moving, walking five metres in one second alongside the train carriage, she would record her speed as being five metres a second, because she travelled five metres in one second. So she would be observer one there, if you like. So that's observer one. Observer 2 here is a different frame of reference. He'd actually get the same one this time because at the moment their two frames of reference are actually identical. They're not moving with respect to each other. So he would also get 5 metres per second at the moment. However, if we now change things and move the girl's frame of reference at a steady speed, so it's still an inertial reference frame, at say 10 metres a second here, the girl would still recall, would still record a measurement of 5 metres a second same five metres, travelled in one second. Okay? But the outside observer here in frame two would record that differently because they'd see that while she was walking five metres during that second, the train moved forwards ten metres, so the length was 15 metres in length. And if you do that in a time of one second, that's 15 metres a second. So for this person, they've observed the velocity to be 15 metres per second. So relative to them, they get a different result to relative to the girl. So this is this idea that the same event can be recorded differently by two different observers in different reference frames. Okay? So this is this idea about relativity here. Okay? The same event is measured as being different relative to the different reference frames. Okay? Now, special relativity refers to what's going to happen at higher speeds, much higher speeds than we normally experience, and this is the weird one. Okay? It's based on two postulates. The first one we've already been using, the idea that the laws of physics that are the same in all different inertial reference frames. It didn't matter which one you're in, if it's a steady speed or zero, you're going to get the laws of physics behaving the same. So all those laws and formulas we've used before would be relevant here. The new thing here is that the speed of light here, C, is constant no matter which frame you're observing it from. So if I'm watching a speed of light in here in this room that I've re uh, released and I've measured the speed here, I would get the same value, you know, the maximum speed you can get in a, in a vacuum, as if I was watching it being released in a high-speed rocket ship where they suddenly, suddenly shot a beam forwards. The speed of light to me would still be the same, um, regardless of whether it's being released from a moving object or here with me in the stationary frame that I'm talking about. Okay. Now that has some weird implications. So if you think about it here, we've got a girl here who's got a flashlight who's going to release a beam of light, and at the moment she's travelling at a speed of zero, and you'll get the same speed of light reference from hers and also this person here. No problems there. What happens though if you imagine the train going really, really fast, say at half the speed of light then? So does the beam of light here still read as C to the girl? The answer is yes. Now, our other examples, we've just gone off from here, the speed is C plus a half C. It's one and a half C. That's the speed I should get. But no, that does not happen because C is the fastest speed you can get in a vacuum. So here, we can't have that as 1.5C. So you've got a problem. C is always observed as being the same no matter which frame you observe it from. Speed of light's the same. Now that's the only way that this could actually do this and travel further, the further distance, the further length, and still have a constant speed of light. Something to bear in mind, that V is equal to L over T. Oh, sorry. The velocity is the distance travelled over the time. So we're setting the speed of light here, which has to stay the same in all frames. But here I've just observed it to go further than it should have, right, than we expected. It's gone further from this viewpoint. The only way that can stay the same is if that's gone up, gone a further length, this has to have gone up. 
In other words, time is stretched out. For this observer here, time is stretched out for that event. It's longer. It's been dilated. It's larger. So this is called time dilation, OK? So I've got a little clip from uh, Flash Course Physics. I think it's number 42, just to show you, to give it an idea of that. Say Bob stands on the side of his train car that's closer to the platform and he's facing a mirror on the opposite side of the car, five metres away. He shines a flashlight towards this mirror which reflects the light right back towards him. From Bob's point of view on the train, the situation is very simple. The light travelled straight to the mirror and back, a distance of 10 metres, at the speed of light. Sure, looking through the window, you saw the light travel to the mirror and back, but meanwhile, the train was still moving. While the light travelled towards the mirror, the mirror moved sideways relative to your spot on the platform. And while the light travelled back toward Bob, Bob moved even further sideways. So if you look at this here, according to Bob, the length or distance travelled by the light is just this distance here. But to the observer on the platform, the stationary observer, the non-moving one, it's travelled much further in that, for that same event. So for speed of light to stay the same, this longer length has to have been due to a longer time measured for this person here. They're going to measure time as being dilated, the non-moving observer, compared to the moving one. In other words, they will actually measure time more slowly here. Time will pass more slowly here inside the high-speed train than it does outside. Okay, so this is this idea of time dilation. So if we go back to here then, that's what we're talking about. So let's have a look at this. For an observer measuring an event that is occurring at high enough speeds relative to them, you know, the non-moving observer, they're going to get time dilation. So time is going to stretch out and go longer, all right, uh, than the one that's on the travelling uh, object. So the correction factor that actually been worked out for that different missing piece there, for the extra length that it's travelling, would be used on the Lorentz factor, it's called. Um, Now the Lorentz factor is gamma, and it's given by 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared, which is the speed of that moving one relative to us, normally for high speed things this is noticeable, divided by c squared, the speed of light. Okay, so that factor would actually help us correct for time dilation. So as an example of this here, oh sorry, so um, once you've worked out the Lorentz factor, it turns out that the time measured by the stationary observer will be bigger by this factor compared to the one on the moving frame. So T0 is the moving frame time, this is the stationary observer, it's a gamma factor you times by to work it out. So as an example here, let's say you've got an observer inside a spacecraft that's moving at 0.9c and they record a time like, say, two hours to cook some food on their actual space, spaceship, moving at 0.9 the speed of light. You could be asked to calculate the time it takes to cook the food from the reference frame of someone who's stationary watching that event, if they could see it. Okay. So you work out your Lorentz factor first, gamma equals 1 over that. So what we're going to do here is it was actually gamma is 1 over the square root of 1 minus now v squared. v was 0.9 times the speed of light for v. Okay, And that's going to go over c. And this whole thing was squared for both, wasn't it, like that? So what you should be able to see here is the c squared should be cancelled there. But if I just sort of take this out of the common factor then for a second, get the square outside here, point 0.9c inside and c outside, I'm just going to take the squares out here and put it like that. So you've got point 0.9c over c. The c's can cancel. So you've got 1 subtract point 0.9 squared. So point 0.9 squared is uh, point 0.81. So what's 1 take point 0.81? It's point 0.19. So you want to do 1 over the square root of 0.19 in your calculator there. Or you can do the whole thing in your calculator. And what you're going to get there is 2.29. Okay? Now that's your factor there that's actually going to do the conversions between one frame of reference and the other. So we said that the time here was going to be the gamma times by t naught. So it's 2.29 times by 2 years. You can leave the stuff in years and what else, minutes, seconds for this one because uh, the unit's just going to stay from one to the other here. So in this case, the answer is going to be... The answer is going to be 4.59 years. So the person who's stationary observing that spacecraft goes by, sees that the time for the food to cook is 4.59 years, time is dilated, and it's time shorter for that on the space show, so spacecraft observer. Okay. Now, some other things to keep in mind. 
it turns out that other factors occur. Length contraction occurs. So if you're watching that spaceship as a stationary observer, you will see that the length contracts on there. So if you had a rod on there that was a metre long, uh, measured by the person on the spaceship, the moving observer, that would not look the same to me. I would see it as shrunk in that direction, in the direction of the velocity. So in other words, if you have the train one here, the length of the moving object right, is going to be shorter in the direction of that velocity. So for the train one going at half the speed of light, we would expect, or in this case 0.8 the speed of light, we would expect in this direction, that direction, that it actually becomes shorter. Length contracts. Okay? And if you want to work out how much that is, you use the gamma part of it, which is this part here. But this time you divide it, because length is going to get shorter. Okay? It's worth pointing out that in future lessons we look at the fact that the actual mass from an outside observer, it'll look bigger, okay? And the mental will actually look bigger as well for the stationary observer. Okay, thanks.